Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll get started right now. Uh, a few more people are logging in, but we have a, a great uh, set of participants already. So welcome to another um, uh, C45 Quality Association webinar. My name is Tom Yelanowski. I'm the chairperson of the C45 Quality Association and also your host for today. Uh, we are all here to learn a bit more about terpenes, um, some uh, uh, compounds commonly found in cannabis and other plants that provide uh, these plants their aromatic diversity and also potentially some of their effects. Um, obviously, these uh, these compounds are a big thing for the industry, especially in the recent years. And we at the association thought uh, as part of our kind of education and outreach um, uh, you know, opportunities, we thought that we would organize an event to discuss them. So uh, we're we're going to get started here shortly. But uh, as people are still logging in, I'm going to do what I always do, uh, introduce our association, do a bit of housekeeping, and then I'll introduce our presenters from Phytochemia. So uh, for those of you that may not be aware, um, the C45 Quality Association is uh, quite a unique industry association here in Canada. Uh, we're a registered non-for-profit organization started a few years ago by industry professionals, and we represent over 100 individual members across Canada, primarily in the quality lab testing and regulatory roles. Um, we are different uh, compared to other organizations uh, because we, we focus on representing the people working in the industry, not the corporations themselves. So uh, you know, we, we do this because we at the time and still believe that uh, the industry needed a unified voice for quality lab testing and regulatory professionals here in Canada and also abroad. And uh, especially as this industry kind of moves quickly and evolves, uh, we want to be at the forefront, engaging our regulators, engaging the public, engaging the industry, uh, providing a platform for all of us to network and get educated and hopefully improve. Um we typically host webinars like this monthly. We have, I believe, uh, one or two uh, more we'll be announcing for the rest of the year quite shortly. So we'll be doing one on imports and exports, hopefully within the next few weeks, as well as one on kind of lab accreditation like ISO 17025 in November. So the best way for you to, to kind of uh, know about these is to go to our website, c45association.com. And so uh, enter your email and then you can be a subscriber to our email list. And we promise we won't spam you. Typically, it's once a month, maybe twice a month when we have events or, or major announcements. What we really do hope is uh, you consider joining us uh, to be a member. A membership start at $49 per year for students, $99 for non-voting, $199 for voting. Uh, that money allows us to operate uh, as a non-for-profit, do all our accounting or bookkeeping, obviously run our website and uh, sometimes engage uh, with, with different regulators if we have to travel. But that's basically it. Um, and we are in the early stages of planning a uh, quality summit or something uh, thereabout in, in the new year, um, uh, kind of uh, late spring, early summer next year. So uh, we're just trying to figure that out. Obviously, it's still a bit of an unknown uh, planning in-person events in, in this uh, day and age, but we're really looking to connect with people and we'll have more information on that as soon as possible. So uh, in conclusion, go to our website, c45association.com. Check out our uh, Twitter or YouTube channel where we have all of our past events or most of our past events archived. And please consider becoming a member or at least reaching out to us at uh, board at c45association.com. If you want to be a presenter, if you want to host an event like this, if you have ideas for events or other um, you know, uh, engagement opportunities, we always uh, need and want volunteers to help us out on our mission. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to now uh, move on to the, to the webinar portion. Um, so uh, this webinar is being recorded um, and it'll be available on YouTube in the coming days and weeks. So if you want to share that, um, please check that out uh, soon. Uh, there's a Q&A box on your Zoom uh, platform. Please use that. Those questions are public. You can upvote them. You can comment on them. We're going to take them kind of in order uh, at the end of the, the, the presentation. So please put them in there. If there are any other issues, for example, technical issues, just hit me up on the chat box. 
and I'll get to that as soon as possible. And overall, we want to keep things happy and constructive and positive. So uh, make sure that uh, your comments or questions um, are, are in that kind of tone. All right, without further ado, um, I'd love to introduce to you um, my colleague at the C45 Quality Association and also one of the founders at Phytochemia, Hubert. Uh, Hubert, say hello to everyone. Good evening, good afternoon. Uh, so thank you, Tom, for this invitation. So just a quick uh, who we are regarding phytochemia. We are a phytochemical analysis lab. We were founded in 2013. Myself and Alexi uh, are co-founder. Cool. Uh, one of our special interests, uh, personal and professional, are the volatile in general. So all the volatile fraction of the plant and chemotyping. So I'll, I'll also let Alexi introduce himself a little bit. So as Hubert said, uh, we studied together at uh, the Université du Québec at Chicoutimi. Uh, we mostly dealt with plant uh, testing and uh, plant science during our studies. So phytochemia was uh, the, the extent uh, of the same kind of interest. Uh, we became best known in the first place with uh, essential oils. And when the cannabis industry kicked in uh, in Canada, well, it was all natural for us to become quite interested in what people call terpenes. And this, uh, this nuance will be important during the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you both. Good luck on the presentation. I'll see you at the Q&A. So let me... The name of the title of this presentation is going to be terpene, what they are and what they are not. So let's jump right in by asking yourself, what is a terpene? Um, it's quite uh, convenient that we actually have a very thorough definition of a terpene, which is uh, given by the UPAC Gold Book, the UPAC behind being the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, which is an organization that helped chemistry space to harmonize themselves among other by giving uh, regulated terminology. So the definition of a terpene is an hydrocarbon of biological origin, having a carbon skeleton formally derived from isoprene, which is important. And there are some subdivision to that. So this is the isoprene. The isoprene is a small five carbon molecule and it acts as a building block, a little bit like Lego, of all uh, terpenes. So from there, we just pose it what we could call um, the chemical space of cannabis. So some of you will recognize some very typical names, such as myrcene and betacryophylline, uh, THC, and canflavin, for example. Some a little less known, such as trisoriol, fridolin, um, some newcomers such as Prenilteol. Um, and we will try to see how we can split them based on these definitions. So if we use the strict UPA Gold Book definition of terpene, these are the terpene. So as the definition pointed, uh, uh, the terpene are hydrocarbon, meaning that they don't have any substitution. So if we were to be testing the terpene, we would need to test all the compounds that are made from isoprene and that don't contain any special substitution. Um, that's a little bit reductive, meaning that when we're talking, when we have this idea of uh, cannabis terpene, people will say, well, there's linalol among other, there's terpeneol, there, there are other compounds that some people would recognize uh, from having heard heard them in, uh, in different presentation or different paper, but they don't really fit the definition, or at least the basic, the uh, absolute definition of terpene. So we'll introduce the concept of terpenoid. And the terpenoid also have a definition in the UPAC Gold Book. And they are compounds that were derived from isoprene, such as terpene, but they also contain oxygen in various functional groups. And they are also subdivided furthermore, depending on their number of carbon. So if we pick our um, cannabis chemical space and starting from terpene, we also add the terpenoid. Then we have this subcategory appearing. And this starts to look a little bit more like 
the compounds that we would see when people are talking about uh, the cannabis terpene. However, it's not everything. I mean, people are talking about ester, which are a subcategory of compound, for example, exyl acetate or exyl hexanoate, which are compounds that are very typical in cannabis. And there's also other compounds that may be in this category that are not very well known, such as pranilthiol, which is, depending on the definition, maybe a, a nemiterpenoid. But we'll see a little bit about that later. So what about the rest? So for example, the ester. The ester are compound that contains uh, uh, a, a next, uh, an oxoacid bridge, basically an alcohol and an acid that are merged together. And after that, you have the thiol, which are a little bit a newcomer into this space, but were suspected from a long time based on what is known from thiol in general, and also what is known from the cannabis closest parent being the hops and the thiol or the compound that contains a sulfur compound. And you also have the phenolic, which will be uh, going back in a few moments. So if from each of these, we add the category around them, you'll have the ester, the prenyl, the thiol, and the phenolic. As I said beforehand, uh, terpenes can be divided in subcategories, depending on their number of carbons. So you will probably have heard of monoterpene, sesquiterpene, diterpene, sesterpene, a little bit less common, triterpene, and you can go to tetraterpene and carotenoids, for example. So putting them into our cannabis space, you will notice that the smallest one, the C10 compound are the mono. Then after that, you have the sesqui, the D, and the triterpene, which is pretty straightforward. However, there's a little bit of sand into the, uh, the gear because there's also what we call the meroterpene. The meroterpene are hybrids. They are compounds which are made from a terpenid moiety and a phenolic uh, moiety. And for example, cannabinoids, the phytocannabinoids are the poster child of the meroterpene. Uh, so delta-9 THC, CBG, CBD, are all considered to be meroterpene. And so is canflavin, which is a phenolic uh, flavonoid, but with a terpene moiety. So when we're talking about the terpene in cannabis, some people will say, well, this is vast, this is global. There, there, is, no, um, there is no limit. So it's probably just the aroma and the flavor. Well, yes, but actually no. Um, if we're talking about the aroma, we'll probably just talk about the volatile, which is the compound of all the less the smallest molecules that are found into the cannabis, which <clears throat> in case of the terpene or the terpenoid will be everything under the D-terpene, uh, but would also include the thiol and the small aliphatic ester, such as, as I said, exyl acetate. But these are not really representative of the aroma, because if you look at what we have here, which is an aromagram, an aromatogram, sorry, uh, the way that this work is quite interesting. On one side, the upper side, you have what would be a general chromatogram, meaning that each compound of the volatile fraction of the cannabis has been split and a peak. Uh, or the signal represent a compound. And on the bottom in red, you have a nose, uh, a human who was put at the end of the, of the GC. And for each time the person in question would smell something, they would take a note and indicate that there would be a smell coming out of the GC. And afterward, you would just combine those two and you would have an aromatogram which give you an idea of which compound give the strongest aroma or the strongest um, odor into the mixture. You will probably notice that there are few very large peaks into the black part, meaning that there are few main compounds, uh, but there are a lot of 
large peak into the red part, meaning that there are a lot of different smells that were detected by the human nose. Um, so you, you can split these pair in three large group. The first group being a strong aroma with a large peak. Um, they are labeled as A. So in this case, you have a, comp a, a strong aroma that is considered characteristic of cannabis and with a large peak. So you could probably expect that the, um, the, the aroma is coming from this compound. You also have B, which is no aroma, but a significant peak. So we have a few peaks there that are large enough to be seen without any further manipulation, but doesn't give any aroma. Um, and you also have the more interesting case, which is a very strong aroma, but a minor or no peaks at all. So this aromagram, this graph is coming from an article from 2015. Um, and the peaks label with a star indicate that the user would have targeted them as a characteristic aroma, a cannabis char characteristic aroma, which is a little bit pungent or a little bit, well, the cannabis aroma in general. Uh, what's interesting is that there are a few in the C category, meaning that there are a lot of these aroma that are not detected or not identified, and a very few which are directly linked to a compound. In the current case, the two that were identified and pointed out as, as characteristic is beta pinene and aloe aromodendrine, which is interesting in itself because the beta pinene doesn't really smell like cannabis. And I don't expect aloe aromodendrine to smell either like cannabis. So while this is a very good article, there are a limitation to this. And especially if you look at the uh, the, the part label C at the, at the beginning, um, these are one of the more uh, dense area where there are characteristic, uh, cannabis characteristic odor coming out. Um, at the time in 2015, uh, most people would suspect that what would give the skunky aroma of cannabis would be a uh, tile compound. However, the characteristic of tile compound are that they are detectable by your nose at a very, very, very low level. Uh, more uh, at a level that is lower than what most uh, instrument can pick up. And it was only a few years later in 2021 that group uh, actually found what which compound they were. So they were prenyl thiol and some derivative of thereof, which even though they are in a very, very, very minute quantity, they do give a very, very strong aroma. Um, so that's one of the, the reason why the terpene profile is not exactly the aromatic profile. It's not the aroma profile. It's, the major compound don't really give an idea of what will be the smell of a flower. And the reason for that is because our nose tend to blunt out or to mute the compounds that are the most common in nature. Uh, beta pinene, for example, is very common. It's emitted by a lot of plants. So if you walk into a natural park or in a forest, uh, you will have some very characteristic odor, but you won't be overloaded. Your sense won't be overloaded by all the, the, the comp volatile compound that are emits by the plant. And that's a natural reflex and that's evolutionary, meaning that if we would always react to the most common stimuli, we would be overstimulated -stimula and we just won't be able to differentiate what would be an important stimuli and what wouldn't be an important stimuli. Um, so this is why our nose is usually more apt and was developed by evolution to detect um, things that are uncommon. So for example, the tile, the surface compound are indication of spoilage because they are often found 
into uh, degrading, um, into uh, decomposing protein, for example. So we are a lot less picky and a lot less sensitive to these compounds than we are to compounds that are part of our everyday um, environment. So this is why, especially in perfumery, you will notice that the difference and the most powerful aromatic compound are compounds that, that are in a very, very minor quantity. So what are the total terpene? Uh, we often see this in COAs and or even into uh, on labels. So people would list total terpene as a value just beside the total cannabinoid, the total THC, for example. Well, the total terpene is the sum of the analyzed volatile of the analyzed, usually volatile compound based on the lab method. And this is the important part is that since we don't have any clear definition well, we do have one clear definition of what is a terpene, but the industry as a whole tend to use a more a more wider definition. Uh, what constitutes the total terpene analysis is variable and it's not uniform. It's not something that is uh, that is controlled either. So in general, it is not well defined. It's not either an indication of quality because uh, different uh, cannabis cultivar will probably have different level of, produ uh, of producing and they may not be direct correlation between the quality of a product and the level of the terpene. And it's not either an indication of the aroma strength as pointed earlier. It, this value requires a context. For example, different list, different results. So different lab or different a uh, vendor of a uh, standard will have a different list of, of compound that they will be offering into their terpene piles. There are two large categories of testing in this regard. There's a targeted method, which will be using a well-defined defined list of compound. And that is usually based on the availability, uh, the availability of standards and also their cost. There's also another method on categories which are untargeted method, which are pretty common in metabolomics or biological analysis, and they call chemistry, which is comparing a full profile against a larger database. For example, in our case, it's more than 10,000 compounds, and even if there is no standard. So in this case, the quantification is done through uh, response factor and algorithmic calculation. So if you compare two different methods in the case of untargeted and targeted, so in our case, we have two different lists. We have the full in which uh, we just try to scan for everything that we can and we'll usually return a number of compound, volatile compound over a hundred. So for example, the full one here into our example analysis, we have 138 anal anal compounds with a total terpene of 43.16 milligram per gram, which is more or less 4.3%. And we also made a sub list, which is based on what we observed uh, into all the analysis that we've done. So for example, compound which have plurimodal distribution, a distribution that seems to vary between being there and not being there, and that are not a continuous distribution, which is often indicative of chemotype or more fundamental variation into the biology of the plant. So this number, this panel is composed of a list of 88 uh, compounds that we identify as more interesting. So. The number of analytes in this analysis is 78. And the reason why the number is smaller is because if the compound isn't there, then you just don't report it, which bring the total terpene to 41 milligram per gram, just a little, uh, so 4.1%. And if you look at targeted lists, which are and which are more limited due to the exit, to standard not existing for every compound, you'll end up with a uh, result more into the 2.7%, 2.5%, which is very interesting also. Um, one of the problem with targeted lists is that 
there are in literature a few uh, misidentified compounds, mainly, for example, cedrine, uh, which was identified in a few uh, articles, but is not really present. So the cedrine is, in fact, a misidentified transulfurbergamotine. The, 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 the name of the compound is not very interesting, but What's interesting here is that the reason why these compounds are misreported as such is because cedrine and transalfarbigramatine have the same mass spectrum and have the same retention time in uh, in most analysis analytical method. So you will need a, a third confirmation or a third way of confirming if it's cedrine or transalfarbigramatine. Um, what's one of the advantage of going through an untargeted versus a targeted analysis is you shouldn't let the tree hide in the forest. Um, and there are few missing compounds that are not found in standard kit or that are too expensive to be bought as a single compound. And if you don't take them into account, you will uh, ignore a lot of information that could be given by these volatile compounds, which we will come a little bit later to that. So for example, the germacrine B plus, B plus gamma LNN uh, pair uh, can account up to 0.5% in the current analysis that we've shown you. And the interesting part here is that um, gamma alanine is a degradation product of germacrine B. So if you, during the analysis or the treatment of the sample, uh, the germicron we will degrade in one. So you need to check for both if you want to have uh, the, um, the true value. The selenadiene, which are uh, very typical of cannabis. In fact, cannabis is the plant that we know of that produce the most selenine, selenine uh, type compound. And they are often overlooked because since most terpene and most volatile standards are produced from other plant, uh, if cannabis is, is the one producing the most of these compounds, they would tend to be too expensive to be produced commercially. And you also have uh, another category, um, so um, including the transalfarbigramatine, which also can account for a large amount. And you also have another list, which will come later, which are interesting to look at due to the distribution into uh, the plants and the cultivar. So why are they interesting then? As I said, since some of them have different distribution pattern depending on the chemotype or the cultivar, then you can use them as a classification tool, which can help consumer in their decision or just as a general uh, tool to classify different um, strain. And since the aroma does not equal the, the biological activity, there are maybe compounds that are minor that also can be relevant pharmac pharmacologically. But this is, this there is still a lot of data that need to be shown for that. So as I said, there are um, some group or some compound that do tend to uh, have a different, uh, a non-continuous or a plurimodal distribution, for example. Um, we have identified between eight and 12. I'll present the eight main here. So the myrcene, which is very well known, uh, will have a different uh, quanti uh, quantity depending on the cultivar. And after that, you have the pinene family, the terpenolines. Most of you will, re will uh, recognize the main, uh, the parent compound of these family. But as you go deeper, you end up with the selenine and the eudesmol, for example, which are very interesting because if you look at the indica versus sativa uh, classification, which I do not adhere, but you could one of this family, which is Udesmol, is more typical of the Indica uh, family, for example. So this Indica versus Sativa um, separation usually was regarding the pharma the pharmacological effect, um, but it's not well defined either to genetic or to cultivar. 
However, through the volatile profiling, we can start to see some differentiation, uh, which can lead me to a very small note regarding the entourage effect, which is often attributed to terpene and to, um, well, to terpene and to other uh, compound regarding this. While the jury stills out regarding how the entourage effect is pro, uh, prominent or if it's significant, um, most reports are anecdotal and there are still conflicting results from the uh, scientific community. However, as a personal opinion, since we are able to see that there are chemotype in cannabis plant, uh, just based on the distribution of these volatile compounds, which are often called a terpene, then we could probably expect that these may be um, explaining part of the entourage effect, meaning that while it's maybe not exactly the terpene that have a pharmacological effect, their presence may indicate as a proxy either other uh, metabolic, uh, metabological pathway, metabolic pathway that are that I'm sorry, metabolic pathway that are activated or not, and thus giving different pharma pharmacological effect. But there are still studies to be done, and there are still data set that needs to be merged together to be able to have a clear idea of this. So what I wanted to do with this presentation was mostly to show that there are still a lot of unknown regarding the volatile first, but there's also a lack of clear definition. So as an industry, it will be important uh, to have a clear definition of what it is to be able to convey the right message to either consumer or to other participant into the industry. Um, so I would like to have kind of a discussion like what do you see when you see these total terpene level? What do you expect them to be? What are your conclusion regarding this? And how are you using them? So I'm really interested in having some question regarding this. And in fact, at this point, this is also why I joined uh, today's presentation, which was mostly Hubert's work, but uh, I'm the scientific director at uh, Phytochemia. So we're also very eager to see if you have any questions pertaining to the process of testing for terpenes, or uh, if you would like to go deeper into any of the, the elements that were brought up during the, the presentation. We'd be glad to discuss. Absolutely. Well, um, uh, first and foremost, uh, Hubert, thank you for that presentation. Um, it was quite sensational, if I uh, say so myself. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, now is the time. We have about 20, 25 minutes um, to uh, answer everyone's questions. I myself have about half a dozen that I'd like, uh, I'd like to discuss, but uh, we'll start with people in the Q&A box. So if you have a question, uh, please put in the Q&A box or alternatively, if you want to have a little bit more detailed discussion, raise your virtual hand on Zoom and we'll allow you to unmute your mic and we can have a discussion that way. So while we're waiting for people, I see that uh, we have our first question has come in from Ian. I'll read them out and then Hubert or Alexi, you can kind of um, pounce on them as you wish. Okay, so. Uh, Ian asked, do you see any clear aroma differences between the clusters you showed? That's a great question. I, I may answer that in part. Why it would be very interesting for us to do that. Um, there currently isn't a lot of uh, support, uh, I would say, from the industry on that kind of question. The aromatogram that we shown is the kind of study that isn't conducted on large scale because basically people will not want to pay for this kind of assessment. Basically, we're paid to test for terpenes, not what they smell. And then people will make inception and say, oh, yeah, my strain is rich in terpenoline and it smells of citruses. So probably terpenoline has a link with that. But really, the, the scientific background behind that is very thin in general. And it's, it's more a question that should be asked the academia. So basically, we would need people having access to the GC setup to make this kind of assessment. 
And as for a more holistic approach, we currently are having some of our people being trained into perfume reassessment. Uh, this is a little bit of a cross-industry uh, approach uh, to eventually be able to at least have a clear uh, other descriptor that we will be able to um, to link to some of the cluster that we have noticed. Uh, one of the problem with regarding the study that I've shown, the which are kind of a preliminary analysis of the data uh, that we have, is that we don't have access to all these sample still have access to all the sample because we still need to destroy everything into 90 days. Uh, so these are based on purely uh, accumulated historical data. We also have a challenge with uh, discrimination. In fact, uh, if we bring back the slide, perhaps you can see that there are several clusters based on the color of the dots. But this is a, an arbitrary limit that we set. So we said we want to have 20 clusters. We could have said we want to have 60 of them. In fact, if we just go down to the statistically uh, relevant difference between clusters, we end up with hundreds of them. So we also have to find a way to properly tune the sensitivity of this kind of approach in order to get yeah, something that's statistically relevant, but also something that can be stomached and have some sort of meaning for the human beings we are. Awesome. That's great. Thanks, guys. Uh, Ryan here has another question. We'll move on to Ryan. Uh, Ryan asks, how realistic are the terpene levels currently being reported in dried canvas flour? Approximately 3%. What can be done to preserve these terpenes during storage? What would you suggest for shelf life stability? So a few questions in there, and I'll leave it up to you to, to tackle them. Uh, I may, I will start with the, the level uh, uh, of terpenes. Uh, generally speaking, we see a lot of variation with these figures. Uh, when we work with our untargeted assay, we see values that range between uh, below 1% in some hemp material. It's It can be very, very low. And it can go up to 6-7% in some cases. It doesn't seem to be unrealistic. Uh, it's it's quite high to have five, six, seven percent uh, volatile material in a plant, but we have to keep in mind that cannabis has been selected for, for decades and hundreds of years to have a strong smell and to express uh, uh, phytochemicals as opposed to a whole host of our plants. So uh, it's it's quite expected that this plant that has been selected and where you trim the part of the plant that smells the most, that you can reach quite high amounts of uh, terpenes. Now, if you want to have an objective value for that, you would have to go through distillation. And we, we have done a few assessments for that. In fact, if you take a step back, uh, you can say that cannabis is an aromatic plant, just like mint, just like oregano, just like uh, lavender. And for every other plant in cannabis, we won't be talking about terpenes, we'll be talking about essential oils. And the way to test for essential oils is to distill them. So if you take cannabis and you distill it, you obtain an essential oil that basically will contain what we screen for in our terpenes assays. So we were wondering, because the way we test for terpenes, and that's the way the labs will do it, is not through distillation, but through a small solvent extraction, and then we'll determine by GC the amount of terpenes against either calibration curves or uh, an internal standard, which is the way we use. So we wanted to see if there was a correlation between both approaches. And in fact, as you can see in the table here, uh, the agreement is very good. So in general, if you distill the, the plant material, you would get roughly the same figures as you would obtain with at least our testing. So uh, it's it's not unrealistic to see those figures around three to four percent because if you distill the plant, that's what you would get as a mass of essential oil. And I would say that um, in the case of hops, the industry uh, used the distillation methods to establish the compound, the volatile compound uh, content, and. As I as we were saying and as we were showing into one of our previous uh, lists is how realistic is a level of terpene at three percent is. Well, it depends on what you're testing for. I mean, if you're testing for two compounds at three percent, it's a little bit high. But if you're testing for a lot of them, it's 
it, it's more realistic. So I think that in this case, it loops a little bit back to the problem of definition, for example, what is exactly expected on a terpene analysis? Is it only the four main compounds? May they be useful or not? Or is it more a full panels to be able to eventually try to correlate them to chemotype? So I think that as the industry is a little bit young, but as it's evolved and as it's mature, then it will probably be more clear and more evident what will need to be tested for. Hubert, and just as, a, as for the shelf life question, yeah. um, this is not something that we have been able to study in depth, uh, mostly because we have to destroy cannabis after a relatively short span of time. So we cannot keep it on a shelf and see how it evolves over time. Uh, but unless the, the flower is exposed to severe oxidation uh, through exposure to light and air, obviously, uh, chances are that the terpenes will be generally stable, especially within the plant matrix. If you distill the oil, uh, an essential oil can be quite unstable, especially the monoterpenes, the smaller ones, they are quite prone to oxidation. But basically, within the plant material, it can last for a fair amount of time. So if you want to improve stability, keep it out of light, keep the temperature low. And if you can, store it under a nitrogen atmosphere. That's the best way to do it. Yeah. I just had a quick question, actually, um, back to this whole targeted, untargeted uh, assay. So, you know, this has been a pet peeve of mine in the industry where, you know, you see one COA and they, they test for six or seven terpenes and they give you two or 3% and then someone else like yourselves tests for dozens or hundreds and it, it's much different. And even if you have a trace amount, you know, 0.1% of 30 of them, now you've now increased it by 3%. Um, but, you know, because cannabis is so different, uh, the aromas or even the terpenes are so kind of different from, from cultivar and, and strain to strain. Um, what about an approach where maybe you only report the top five or top 10 um, uh, compounds detected and that is, is your or is your total uh, terpene count just to kind of limit the the potential for misrepresenting a you know hundred minor uh, trivial amounts of of terpenes. Um, would you recommend something like that just to kind of somewhat standardize reporting in this industry? If, if everybody agreed on that, that would be fine. But we would have to keep in mind it wouldn't represent, if we stuck to, for let's say, five or 10 compounds for simplicity's sake, it wouldn't represent what we would obtain by distilling the plant. You, you need to go over 10, 15 compounds to do that. And you need to test for a molecule that you cannot purchase at, at the moment as pure standards. So if it's something that everybody agrees about, it's great, but it's not necessarily the total amount of volatile that will be found in the plant either. Yeah. And f furthermore, and that's the very important point, is that as an industry, we will need to globally uh, accept the list that is representative. And this is where I think the research is important. So for example, if you look at the selenine, in some cases, it's 10 milligram per gram on, a, on, the, on the weight. So it can be up to 1% of the plant but in the other case, it they are just around there. So if you look only at the more either the more common or the more uh, concentrated compound, then you will probably skip the compounds that are the more defini de defini defining the uh, the chemotype, for example. The absence so, of something is sometimes very telling too. Yeah, like so, the absence of THC is very telling for some strains. Yeah, exactly. So we expect and we hope that in the long term, we'll end up with a unified list which cover this. But for this, we will first need to join up as an industry to be able to have a very clear and a very uh, thorough definition of what is a chemotype and which are how many they are and which are they. And I do believe that this will need to be a living standard, meaning that it will need to evolve as the industry evolves. Agreed. And just a quick point of clarification, uh, when you talk about distillation and measuring the essential oil versus measuring the plant itself, you're just uh, distinguishing between 
the the content of the plant versus the aromatic potential of the plant is that true by extracting with a with like a steam distillation well yes with a steam distillation you have a physical measurement if you obtain an oil you can see it you have a volume and then we can estimate its its weight using an approximation of density uh, or directly measure density if we have enough of it whereas using strictly a solvent extract and injection into GC, you have peaks where you estimate their concentration in the plant. So it's less physical, it's more analytical. Okay, based on unknown compounds. Okay, yep. got it. Great. Uh, so Ryan, I hope that answers your question. I guess we touched on the, the content, the the storage and and the, the, the shelf life there. Um, so we'll move on to Wei. Uh, Wei asks, what percentage of terpenes can prevent CBD crystallization in vapes? And just for some additional context and personal experience, many people in the industry know that you know, vapes, like, like vape cartridges, are quite popular. THC decarboxylated has re really no issue with crystallizing. But CBD over about 60%, 65%. Uh, tends to crystallize and then it kind of ruins the experience and, and you know, leads to kind of a, a bad, bad consumption experience. So mm -hmm. a lot of the time people will cut or thin out that, that CBD oil with things like terpenes. Um, can either of you speak to this? Uh, maybe both with botanically or, or cannabis drive terpenes. And do you know if there's one method that's better than the other? Um, just things about uh, related to that. That'd be great. To be honest, I don't have any answer regarding this. We know that some compound will crystallize into the terpene mix because in this case, the oil is the essential oil, the volatile is the solvent. But as for this specific case, honestly, I don't have any idea. And it's probably specific to each blend of compounds to... So honestly, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that. If you take a single terpene, whether it contains a first oxygen or not will probably have a huge impact. Uh, and if you take a blend of terpenes, then depending on the strain, you will have different makeup of the terpenes. So it can affect, it's it's not like working with a pure solvent where you can say, well, yes, uh, if I have 25% ethanol in this, it won't crystallize. It's not as straightforward when working with complex uh, mixtures like this. So it would have to be tested with the terpenes blend that would be used in this case, whether synthetic or obtained from a given cultivar and tested over time to see if it crystallizes. If you had to speculate though, do you think the mode of action is just simply diluting would lead to uh, you know, dissolving uh, the, the terpenes uh, act as a solvent and they, they kind of bring it down to, to a level where it doesn't crystallize or it just inhibits crystallization even if it's present at low amounts? No, I think it's purely solvent. Sol mm -hmm. yeah. It's more of a solvent effect. And it probably has to deal with temperature too. So perhaps at some lower temperatures, CBD will tend to crystallize more. So even if it's soluble at one point, if you're too close to the crystallization point and then the temperature drops a bit, you probably have just this small crystal that starts to grow. Yeah, especially if you have differential evaporation rates, you might start with a stable product, also, but then halfway through you've evaporated or vaporized more of the terpenes than the CBD, and then you get to that same issue. So, okay, that that's great. Thanks. Uh, Ian has another question here. Do you have analytical standards for key non-terpene compounds that you mentioned, um, such as hexyl acetate? No, uh, but if you do have some, I would like to have some. No, but at least for the perennial tile. Yeah, uh, we that Mr. Oswald was one yeah. of the authors of the study on the perennial tile. So he probably has more access to this than we have. We, we try to spot those, uh, those sulfur-containing molecules in the regular terpene screening assay we have, but they're simply not concentrated enough, so we don't see them. It, it, and it, as for the axyl acetate, I do believe that we have standard that we have produced in-house. However, uh, for a little bit more of technical on the technical side for the quantification of the targeted analysis, we are using the IOV uh, uh, suggested factors. method. The what? We, we use response factors. Yeah, so we response not, factor. We do not have calibration for each constituent. So basically, we use just one internal standard and quantity everything against it, everything that we can detect, which is the exception for the tiles. 
We yeah. can do that. Yeah. And to little give a little bit of background on the method, the IOF, which is the International Organization of the Flavor Industry, published in 2018. Uh, an article um, which were the recommended method to quantify uh, the compound in a flavor uh, extract from natural origin, in which they made a large UD, especially in Europe, using uh, an interlab uh, ring testing, uh, where they were able to establish a formula to find a correction factor on FID only and not on mass spectra uh, of uh, the signal of a compound based on its structure uh, brought over an internal standard, which is in this case is methyloctanoid. And they had a 5% variation, from what, if I recall correctly, the article. And we also confirmed the method against uh, interlab study and proficiency testing in cannabis, in which we had a 5% variation limit or 7.5%, I think, into the the most extreme one. Awesome. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Two more questions, and I have at least one I'd love to pick your brain about. Uh, it's been kind of um, a question of mine, but we'll save that to the end. So uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, and uh, we'll move to um, uh, Carolyn, uh, I believe. Do the most con uh, common cannabis terpenes like myrcene or uh, and caryophylline, caryophylline have di uh, distinct aromas, and do they define the majority of the strain bouquet, as many people believe? No. Well, yeah. But for the first part of the question, do they have distinct aromas? Most of them do. It, I mean, if you pick a bottle of pure myrcene and smell it, it has a smell. It reminds of something like hops. Um, but then does it explain the majority of the aroma? Clearly not. If you take orange oil, which is 95% limonene, and you strip out the limonene entirely, it still smells pretty much like an orange. And the limonene itself doesn't smell much like the orange. So it's, it's a bit of the same here. These compounds may participate in the aroma, but they probably are not the main contributors. Probably that the small tiles have much more of an impact in the end. That's an interesting point about stripping away the the limonene and still smelling like citrus. It's working. For example, mint uh, mint oil usually they strip the menthol to sell it as a menthol, pure menthol, and it still smells exactly the same. Wow. Yeah. But then the menthol itself will also smell like it. Yeah. Yes, but the the mint oil, even with the menthol content lower, will still. Hmm. So it's not a matter of strictly picking the main compound and saying, well, this smells like this. So the whole smells like this. It's more complex than that. Interesting. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay, two more questions here uh, on the Q&A. Bob Chapman asks, what do you consider a suitable level of testing error or variation of the total terpene value versus that of testing error of an individual terpene like limonene for cannabis flower? We, we, uh, we can speak for the validation we conducted on our method. It may differ for other labs because each lab has its own approach to this. Uh, we have estimated that the total terpenes metric, if we take the, the full list of what we test, we have approximately plus minus 20% uh, confidence with, with the 95% confidence interval. Whereas for a single compound, it's more in the vicinity of 25, 27%. It's a bit higher for a single compound. And then we must keep in mind that for when we are dealing with very complex uh, profiles, and especially for the smallest peaks, we have a lot of collusion. So there can be interferences. And so the smaller the peaks become, uh, the small, also the more crowded a part of the chromatogram is, the more important the error can be for a single small compound. Okay, but around 20, 25%, so slightly more yeah. than for kind of major compounds like THC that maybe have a 10 or 15% relative error, um, acceptable error. Yeah, well, can still reach a bit higher than that too, even for the main ones. Phytochemistry is not pharmaceutical testing. So in general, the variation is higher than people would like them to be, even us, but we're stuck with these kind of results. Yeah, that's great. 
Okay, uh, Katie has a great question that I actually had on my list as well. So uh, Katie here asks, botanical terpenes, what's your thoughts? Is myrcene the same from botanical uh, terpene manufacturers with that from dried cannabis or just generally, just to give, give people context? Uh, this is quite true for extracts um, uh, or common in this industry and, and many other jurisdictions for things like vapes, extracts, even infused um uh, you know, dried cannabis kind of uh, keef covered uh, pre-rolls, uh, manufacturers will buy off the shelf botanically or naturally derived terpenes, meaning that they're coming from a plant, just not from cannabis. Uh, you know, there's a lot of advantages to this. It's not a it's not a cannabis based substance. You can you can cross borders. Uh, it's available in commercially viable amounts, sometimes cheaper than cannabis. Um, but there's also concerns, obviously health and, and others, um, would just love, love to kind of open up this discussion for a few minutes before, as we finish up, what are your thoughts on botanical terpenes and when talking about cannabis versus non-cannabis derived? And, and it's interesting to see the next question too, with D and L mental differentiation, because the two are tied. Uh, if we take mercy. If you isolate it from any plant, say you isolate myrcene from hops, which are probably cheaper than cannabis, and you will reach a purity of 99.9% .9 and then use it. If you isolated the myrcene from cannabis with 99.9% .9 purity, you would basically have exactly the same thing. So there, there's no difference really. That's true for myrcene, but there are some compounds, as uh, at least pointed by the next question, that are optically active. So they can be found in two versions. So this is a bit different. Uh, most tests, including ours, will not check for uh, optical activity of the molecules. You would need chiral GC for that. And to our knowledge, very few people deal with that in the field of cannabis. Uh, so if you isolate some uh, other terpenes, like limonin, can exist in two varieties. Uh, probably it will not be exactly the same ratio if you isolate it from cannabis or if you purchase it from the market, unless you pay special attention to this parameter. So, uh, so that's one part of the answer. The other part is with impurities. If you get something that's 99.9% .9 pure, there's really little uh, problem with that. You will get mostly the same. If you buy terpinolin with 80% purity, then the 20% remaining compounds uh, can differ quite a bit from cannabis. So it all depends on the purity of those isolated terpenes from other botanical sources that you purchase. Or this assume that you want to reproduce exactly what cannabis is and that you know exactly what cannabis is in this case. Um, for most cases, though, the difference is quite minor. So this needs to be taken into account, meaning that if you are looking for these impurity, then it's important. But if you are not looking and don't want them, then maybe it's not that important either. Yeah, yeah interesting. I know the industry will continue to use botanically derived terpenes either to imitate cannabis or cannabis type smells or maybe cotton candy or some other flavors that they want. Uh, but I, we also do know that Health Canada is looking at these and trying to limit them or has in the past attempted to and and will likely continue. So um, it's definitely... In, uh, in flavoring is quite common. I mean, if you um, want to do a maple flavor, you use fennel. Right. So it's usually you are able to get the same result with different origin. Absolutely. I guess in the context of cannabis is you're inhaling it, you're burning it. Uh, you know, uh, the other question is where are you sourcing these terpenes? Uh, they're food Absolutely. grade. They're not in inhale inhalation grade uh, potentially. So um, yeah, st still a lot of work to do on that front. I do have one more question, one question myself that I hope uh, either of you gentlemen can can at least speculate on. Uh, this related to terpenes, but in, found in cannabis. Um, uh, having worked in the industry as a QAP and having seen tons of COAs for ca cannabis and terpenes, and you know, I kind of started plotting up these results. Uh, THC on one axis, total terpenes or dominant terpenes on another, and I kind of observed a very uh, linear positive relationship, often within the same crop, but even outside of the same uh, crop or the plant. 
uh, I would see more cannabinoids and I would see more terpenes. And maybe that uh, the next batch, the crop had some sort of, you know, uh, stressor or something. And uh, we would have less cannabinoids, less terpenes. Uh, are those two related or is it possible for a grower to use environmental controls or fertilizers or stressors to increase terpene concentration in plant and yet keep maintain cannabinoids the same? Uh, any any thoughts on that? That will sure. depend if the metabolic path we are link or not. Uh, in the example that you cited, this probably means that the pathway are connected. Um, and I would guess so because they use the same, uh, usually they, they use the same basic structure. Um, however, it doesn't mean that you could go over the plant total capacity. And I know that in the, if we just go back to the essential oil industry, stressor are used in production in general to be able to achieve a, a higher level of certain compound and sometimes in very specific case to have a different uh, different formulation, uh -huh. for example. Um, I think that this is kind of the part where a lot more research are needed. Uh, I know that some people would even told me that the composition, the, ter the volatile profile would change depending on the location into the uh, greenhouse. So considering that the plant will sometimes use these volatile as a communication vector. Uh, I think that there's still a lot that is unknown that will need to be looked at. Okay, it's a so step back. The, the plant doesn't produce those to please us in the first place. It's generally used as defense or to attract pollinators or or the source. In the case of cannabis, there has been an intensive selection going on to increase the level of cannabinoids and probably the terpenes follow the same path. It may be uh, it may be unwanted. I mean, it's possibly something that just came up to be like this. There may be ways to decouple both. There may not be ways to do it. This has to be discovered yet. Still early days in this industry, mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, that brings us to just at an hour, a little over. So I wanted to thank uh, Hubert and Alexi and as well as uh, Phytochemia for, um, you know, uh, sparing uh, their valuable time uh, to educate us a little bit. I, I definitely know I learned a, a thing or two and I got to brush up on my organic chemistry as well. But uh, I hope all of you listening in had um, had a similar experience and, and enjoyed this. Uh, again, uh, check out our website, c45association.com to find out about our next events. Uh, like I said, we're trying to hold these monthly. We also have a monthly quality time where it's either myself or someone else from um, our association kind of doing an AMA or just a chat. We're, we're having socials for our members every month. So we're really ramping up to have a great year and we're looking for new board members next year. We're looking for volunteers. So, and, and of course, just members. So please check us out. And this recording will also be made available shortly. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, stay safe out there and see you next time. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening.